We want to welcome all of you joining with us on YouTube for our online service. We trust that God is going to transform you and challenge you even as we hear God's word from Pastor Dishan. Join with him as he talks about Jehovah Sitkeno. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide And from the far side of the chasm You held me in your sight So you made a way Across the great divide Left behind throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt I owed broke my chains freed my soul for the first time I had hope thank you Jesus for the It has washed me white Thank you, Jesus You have saved my life Brought me from the darkness Into glorious light You took my place Laid inside my tomb of sin You were buried for three days But then you walked right out again And now death has no sting And life it has no end For I have been transformed By the blood To glorious life There is nothing stronger Than the wonder-working power of the blood The blood That calls the sons and daughters We are ransomed by a Father through Glory to His 
his name There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to his name The last few weeks we've been talking about um, the names of God he, the Hebrew word is Jehovah Jehovah means the Lord and the Lord has different names and each name says something about his character we've gone through the Lord our healer the Lord our shepherd the Lord with us and today um, we're going through two names if time permits past Dishan left and left me with the two for one um, and, and the, 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 the idea that we're going to talk about is Jehovah sit can you the Lord our righteousness I'm not going to keep repeating the Hebrew because even the English is, is complicated enough. But I want you to understand this. The Lord, our righteousness. And innately, we have a sense of justice in us. We want good things to be rewarded. We want bad things to be punished. And if you, if you want a benefit, you need to pay a cost. You, you, we have this in us, right? We want justice. And, and, and I don't know why it really bothered me that some people were getting ahead in the line. And that's a very Sri Lankan thing, right? Cutting lines is a Sri Lankan thing. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I was at Kiel's. I had only five things in my, in my basket, very small. And I was standing in line, maybe two or three minutes, right? Not very long. And then some guy, while I'm standing in line, there were two people in front of me. He went ahead of me like this. He went ahead like that. And he said, Hadis yak. Hadis yak means I'm in a rush, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got to... And I thought, okay, is he in an emergency? Then I looked at his cart and he had like Cracker Jack chocolates and chips and... And I was thinking, what is this hadith here? Right? I don't know if that's happened to you. And, and, and I'll tell you the truth, I just let him go by because I was so shocked that he would do that. And, and I don't know if this is true for you, but when somebody cuts in front of me in the line, I get embarrassed. I don't know why I get embarrassed, they should be embarrassed. But I get embarrassed. And when I went home, it really bothered me. It is not because I lost two or three minutes. It's because we don't like people cutting in line. We don't like it if we all have to do something and pay the price for a benefit, somebody else getting it for free. Good things need to be rewarded. Bad things need to be punished. Isn't that right? Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 to 20. This is what Jesus says. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail, not even a dot basically, of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Verse 19. So if you ignore or relax the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws, but anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 20, and this is important. Look at this. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you are more righteous than the Pharisees and the, and the teachers of the law, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 17, Jesus says, don't misunderstand why I have come. I haven't come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill it. And I want you to understand what he means by the law. The law in the Old Testament, in the, in the writings, was actually not one law, it was 613 laws. 613, 613 laws. Think about this. 613 laws. And the Jews of the time, the people that Jesus was speaking to, was, were just trying to just obey as many of the laws as they could. And how they felt righteous was, how many of these laws am I obeying? Oh, I only obey 300 of the 613, but you obey 200. I'm better than you. And this is what we do. In our minds, we either feel good about ourselves or worse about ourselves based on how many of the laws we have obeyed. 
And the truth is, whether I'm doing well or doing badly, some days I feel I'm, I'm, I'm living the Bible. Some days I feel I, I'm not living the Bible. I always comfort myself with this one thought. Because there's always one other person. That guy. There's always that guy. You know who that guy is? That guy is the guy. I'm in this, this challenging time in our family with two young kids. We are, we are working on our marriage to make sure that it's healthy, that we're going together. And, and sometimes it's tough. But that's okay because that guy, he's been married about the same time as me. right? And he does this whole pretense thing. But I know that he hasn't had an intimate conversation with his wife in five years. I'm at least better than that guy. I sometimes get angry, sure. Very rarely. But that guy, man, his house is like a wrestling match every day. All sorts of expletives going all over the place. He's got an anger problem. I don't have an anger problem. I get angry once in a while. He has an anger problem. There's always that guy. And if you are honest with yourself, every single person here has a that guy or a that girl. Maybe even subconsciously. We compare ourselves with somebody else's family, somebody else's situation, somebody else's life, and we think, hmm, I'm doing, I'm doing okay. I'm doing slightly better. I'm doing a little bit more. I'm doing okay. I'm at least better than him. And the thing is, even that guy has a that guy. That's what I want you to get. Everybody has somebody else. But the problem with Jesus' standard of righteousness is that this. His standard is so high that we are all that guy. We are all bad people. I'll just say, say it like that. We don't like to use the word bad in, in modern times. We are all bad people. I want to go back to where we started this morning. If we are all bad people and, and the Bible says that bad people go to hell, do we really want to get what we deserve? Do we really want to pay the price for what we have done? Have you noticed we want justice for ourselves? We want, to, we want justice meted out. But we always want it meted out to other people. God, you know, a poor that girl, she's such a gossip. Such a gossip. But Dishan, last week weren't you gossip? No, no, Lord, I don't want to talk about that. She's such a gossip. My goodness. God, I'm just so frustrated with that guy. He's such a liar. It just annoys me so much. But Dishan didn't... Two weeks ago, didn't you say that small white? No, God, I'm not ready. I don't want to talk about that. We always want justice for other people. We don't necessarily want justice for ourselves. See, most of our lives, we have been taught that God is keeping score. God is keeping score. And I want to assure you, He is not. We think that I, I'm better than I was last year. I'm doing a little bit more than, more than I did before. Surely, I'll get a mansion in heaven. Oh, I don't watch porn like I used to do before. Oh, I don't, you know, do, do those dodgy financial things at work. Surely, I won't go to hell. We think that we can earn our way to heaven. The problem with that is that heaven is not a place for people who are afraid of going to hell. Heaven is a place for people who love God. The Bible says that we can't earn our way to God. The Bible says that we are dead in our sin. I want you to understand that. That we have no hope, but yet we keep trying to climb up the ladder. A few, a few years ago, very, actually pretty, pretty recently, there was a survey in America. Okay? And Christians, Christians were asked, what is their most favorite Bible verse? What is their most favorite Bible verse? And the number one answer, you want to know what the number one answer was? The number one answer was, God, favorite Bible verse, God helps those who help themselves. Firstly, that's not a Bible verse, that's a quote. But secondly, that is the most opposite to what the gospel is. God doesn't help those who help themselves. We can't help ourselves and therefore God came and rescued us. We look somehow to please God and earn our way, with, earn our way to Him with our righteousness. But we will always fail because we are not, not good enough. 
And I've done this so many times. I come here and just before I take communion, I say, God, I'm never going to lie again. God, I won't get angry again. God, I won't do this again. I, won't, I, I promise. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to make up my mind. I'm not going to do it again. And the problem is you will never get over the sin in your life by trying harder. I love discipline, but self-discipline won't help you. We are too far gone. This is why I love this table. Because this table signifies the fact that Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus did it all, paid the price, all 613 com commandments, done. The law required a perfect sacrifice, someone who hadn't sinned to come and die, and Jesus did that. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, talking about Jesus, Paul says, For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Lord Jesus Christ was dealt with like he was a sinner so that we can be treated like we were righteous. I want you to understand my identity changes when I accept what Jesus did for me. Because, the, because sometimes we come and we, we, we come to the table, we know that we are forgiven and we say, you know, we leave the church and we say, something happens and we say, you know, in the end we are all sinners, no. No. When I come to this table, and when he takes my sin and in exchange gives me his righteousness, in position, I am righteous. I want you to understand that because sometimes we feel like it's humble to say we are sinners. We are not sinners. We are righteous. That is positionally where we are. We are righteous. That is why in the Bible, the writers of the Bible talk to believers and call them saints. Because we are saints now. So this is why we celebrate at this table. My sins are not counted against me and I have his righteousness. We celebrate the fact that we did not get what we deserved. The fact that I don't watch porn, the fact that I don't cheat on my wife, the fact that I don't, you know, do something dodgy at, at work, that does not make me righteous. He is my righteousness. I want you to understand that because we come to this table sometimes and we just do it as a ritual. The entire message of Christianity is in this table. He is my righteousness. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord my righteousness. And as I say that there is no cost, He pays the cost and just coming here makes me righteous, there are going to be a couple of people here who think, oh, that's great. I can do whatever I want now, right? God will anyway forgive me. He is my righteousness. I'm positionally already righteous. I can do whatever I want. But this is what the Bible says in Romans 6. I'm reading from the NLT again. Romans 6 verses 1 and 2. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? When we accept His righteousness, we also accept that we have died to sin. We are righteous now. We are not sinners. And the tension in this life is this, that though we are positionally righteous, the minute we accept what God did for us, what Jesus did for us, we are perfect in Him. The tension is that while we are positionally righteous and perfect in Him, in this life, we are still going through getting perfected. That's one of the tensions in scripture. I am righteous, but I'm also being sanctified. That's the word th that the Bible uses. I'm also still being set apart by God. The other Jehovah, Jehovah Makadesh, the Lord, my sanctification. The Lord is my righteousness. I want you to catch this. But the Lord is also my sanctification. I am righteous in Him, but also He's working on me. If you are looking to see what you can get away with, you come to church and you think, okay, how will I go about doing what I want to do without getting zapped by God? If that's you, you have misunderstood what the whole point of righteousness is.
those of us who have been brought up in church and there'll be a few of us who've like been brought up in church we're a multi generational church now we struggle with this a lot because often we have a higher standard for each other than most people do if you are new to church and you came from a messy background in your life you were a mess and you came in here odds are that you'll expect that everyone else is like you and everybody's a mess but people like me you know we are very bit hypocritical we come here and we expect such a high standard from everybody else not everybody but i'm saying a fair few of us we think that the the rules that the church or, or the bible put on us are oppressive everyone's a hypocrite and everyone's pretending and that's because we haven't understand what the point of these laws and rules are the laws and rules are not there to show everybody how holy we are the laws and rules are just an expression obeying them are an expression of our love for god it's why it's, in the gospel of john it says jesus says if you love me you will obey my commandments the rules themselves aren't the point they're just an expression of our love i don't flirt with other women not because that's a rule in my marriage i don't flirt with other women because i love my wife you are you with me this morning holiness is just an expression of our love towards god the moment i think that god's laws are a bunch of do's and don'ts that i have to do i've lost the whole relational aspect of holiness i wanted to get where i'm coming from we don't do good because it's the right thing to do we don't do good because it even pleases god we do good because we love him the bible says we should love god with all our hearts all our souls all our minds have you ever thought that if we really loved god completely completely we would never sin I want you to think about that. If we really loved God completely with all our hearts, we would have no capacity for sin. This is why we are being sanctified. This is why God is still changing our lives because he wants us to get to that place. Sanctification is the process of me learning how to love God fully. Often we think, "Hey, pastor, I'm uh, I'm really finding it hard to pray." don't feel like reading my bible i think i mean there's a problem with my prayer life i want to tell you straight up that's not a prayer issue that's a love issue that's what that is and i want to help you as we close this morning and go to this table i want to help you if you have practically we preach for life change we don't preach just to impress people we preach for life change i want to give you some practical ideas about if you feel that you're kind of at a standstill with god or maybe you're slipping back how you can re- reignite your love for god and the first thing i want to tell you is this if you feel like you're kind of stepping back with covid things have got a bit easier we've been at home a lot and we just don't know how to reconnect with god i'd suggest that a practical thing you go back to doing what you were doing when you first fell in love with god very practical thing go back to doing what you were doing when you first fell in love with god what i mean by that is go read the bible the way you used to even though you don't feel like it now go serve in the church the way you used to go join a small group the way you used to whatever has become inconvenient to you now go back and do it again i want to just make a massive push for being in a small group this is a huge church if you are part of this church and you don't have some kind of smaller group community you are missing out this uh, this church will not not be spiritually healthy for you i want to tell you you can be here and not belong some type of small group whether it's a small group we have i think close to 700 small groups in our church forget small groups we have things called family altars where maybe you don't have the opportunity to go to a small group but your family can get together maybe there's mentoring something where you can be accountable have you given permission to anybody to call you out is there anybody who tells you Hey what are you doing? Don't be a fool. Are we so far apart? Is, is our appearance so sanitized that nobody actually knows what's going on? If you come to the people's church and you are not in some kind of small group community of some kind, you are missing out. To meet in groups where people can really know us, we can be known and we can know other people. You can hide here and feel like you're doing okay, but not really be doing okay. So the first thing I would tell you very practically is go back to doing the things you were doing when you first fell in love with God. 
And the second thing, and this is where I'm going to stop. And I felt really convicted about this. We need to go back to hating sin. We need to go back to hating sin. And I thought about my own life and I thought, I, I am okay with not sinning. I try not to sin. But do I hate sin? The Bible tells us to put sin to death. It's violent language. It's often what we think is we think we can control sin. We can manage sin. That'll be okay. But we don't put sin to death. We don't kill it. The Bible says that the devil prowls, a lo- prowls around like a rolling lion. Have you heard that? The devil prowls around like a rolling lion, waiting to see who he can devour. And yet most of us, we treat the devil like he's a little puppy dog. We can manage it. We can keep him okay. We can take, I know there's a little bit, it's okay. We don't kill him. I just want to be honest with you as I, as I pray and as I, as I prepare. I want to tell you this. If you are here and you're playing on the edge, you are going to get eaten up by the devil. For those of us who, who go to work and there's a small stolen glance with someone who's not our spouse. There's an emotional connection with someone who we are not married to. And we enjoy that look or that smile or that secret stare and we think it's not sin I'm not cheating on her or him you are taking sin too lightly for those of us who think it's a little bit of porn pastor I can control this it's a small lie I have to do it pastor if not you know business can't go ahead no, in, our, in our country you know no pastor what I know, know is what I do know is what the word of God says that said we can't lie The devil is prowling around like a roaring lion. We need to beat him to death. It's violent language. We need to hate sin. If we see sin, sometimes we see sin but we don't hate it. I feel very, very convicted about that even in my life. Do I hate sin or do I try not to sin? There's a difference. Do I hate sin or do I try not to sin? Sometimes we come here and we can pretend. We know the words to the songs. And even if you don't know, you can see the words on your screen. And all you have to do is follow the person on the screen. And when they raise their hands, we raise the ha- our hands and close our eyes. And we know how the church game works. But often people don't know what's going on in our hearts. People don't know the mess that we might be living in. And this table is a table of confession because of that. Confession is a scary place to come to if you have a lot of mess in your life and if I have a lot of mess in my life. But confession is a wonderful place to come to because it's at confession that we realize who our God is. Father, we thank you for your word that has come to us very, very powerfully. Father, I pray that the very essence of your righteousness would be imparted into our hearts. Lord, that we will change. That, Lord, we will come into that place of recognizing that we are nothing without you and that we are sinners. And Lord, that we need your grace. Father, as we turn to you, would you cleanse us and Lord, impart your righteousness over us. We thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.